Well, here we are. After years of waiting, 2020 is finally over. Obviously, many problems are not going to be isolated to just this past year, but it's a nice feeling to have a fresh start to make an effort to provide the next 12 months with a better legacy than the past 12. While the video game industry took a hit in terms of management and making the conversion to a work-from-home mentality, which obviously impacted everyone, video games themselves were bigger than ever. With self-isolation, depression, and often a lot of free time meant the opportunities for some at-home pastimes to pick up the slack, and for a lot of people, that meant gaming. A chance for escapism, engagement, and connectivity during this hard time. This affected me as well. I try and make a list every year with my favorite games, and I found myself having a harder time than ever deciding my preferences simply because I was playing so many different games this year. Free time allowed me to finally kickstart some long-term projects like voiceover work and this YouTube channel. This year I had the opportunity to play some amazing games, though obviously not all of them. I didn't purchase a next-gen system, so I was unable to play a lot of PlayStation exclusives, and I was afraid to subject my original PS4 to those games that would surely melt it in an hour. Shh, shh. Soon enough, buddy. It's okay. You're almost done. Also, Animal Crossing New Horizons, which, while not my thing, is hard to understate what it meant to a lot of people during this pandemic, and deserves to be considered as one of this year's best titles. Also, a quick showcase of non-2020 games I played for the first time that were really good. Go! So, now let's talk about the games that made the most impression on me this year. I feel like it should go without saying, but this is entirely subjective. If I have games on here that you didn't like, or I missed out on one of your favorites, that's fine. Let me know what your hits were for the year. We all definitely had our own ways of getting through 2020, and these are just my personal favorite of those experiences that I liked enough to be able to gush about in this video. Without further ado, let's begin. My Top 10 Games of 2020. Shantae Games always managed to put a smile on my face, and the latest entry in WayForward's flagship franchise was no different. Shantae and the Seven Sirens manages to continue the tradition of exuding all sorts of charm into a simple but continuously fun Metroidvania. This year was almost exclusively more of a ARPG heavy year for me, and so I didn't get the chance to experience too many of one of my favorite genres in games, the aforementioned Vania of the Metroid variety. As a longtime fan of Shantae and her series, I was excited for a game in the half-genie hero art style, but a return to the Metroidvania roots of the franchise. While I appreciated and enjoyed the level-based structure of half-genie hero, this game style is definitely where WayForward is at their strongest. A nice, fleshed-out world to explore and fully complete. Shantae once again controls fairly well, and it's easy to pick up her playstyle. Fusion Magic was a welcome addition along with dancing abilities that streamlined Shantae's moveset, allowing for fast, simple to pick up gameplay. Smaller dungeons within the overworld were well implemented, and the wide variety of collectibles, including the monster cards, made going for 100% consistently engaging. As mentioned earlier, I love the Shantae series for its art style, charm, and humor, and that's on full display here. There's some great animated cutscenes, along with some wonderful story beats, and plenty of self-aware moments and gags that just remind me why I love this series. Not to mention another solid soundtrack that adds a lot to this quaint world. It's not a massive game, but what's here is great. It's a cute, fun, and tight metroidvania that will leave a smile on anyone's face who plays it. It's nice to see the Shantae series finally entering a solid stride for itself after being in limbo for the first decade of its existence. I wanted a solid Shantae platform adventure in the modern art style, and that's exactly what I got. It's also what I think is a solid entry point into this growing series. So, if you've been meaning to try out a Shantae game, or just want a simple relaxing Metroidvania to keep you busy, you can do far worse than Shantae and the Seven Sirens.
After plenty of anticipation and a couple delays, the follow-up to the surprisingly impressive Doom reboot was finally released. It was only until recently that I finally got to play Doom 2016 and I was very impressed. A perfect evolution of bringing what made the old school FPS's great into the modern era. The frantic motion, the arena style combat maps, and the blood pumping score and set pieces. It was all amazing, and I wish I had played it right when it came out. Though I still played it in time to be excited for its follow up, Doom Eternal. Rip and tearing through id's modern shooter Marvel was a lot of fun, and more of that sounded great. So is it a worthy successor to Doom 2016? Well, yes and no. First the good as well as the improvements over 2016. We still have the frantic combat and fast paced shooting mayhem. More variants in guns and mods, as well as, in my opinion, perfecting the glory kill system was all great polishing that was certainly welcome. The exploration and platforming elements I've heard were a bit controversial, but I thought they were great and more refined than the previous installment. Navigating the environment was almost always fun, and collections being more streamlined was welcome along with the implementation of an easier to understand and complete demonic corruption system. I thought this was a lot of fun, especially for a completionist like myself. The hub area was a nice addition as well. It felt nice getting a place to display all my collectibles while maintaining the Doom aesthetic. Just as before, the soundtrack is incredible. It's a shame about the audio mixing struggles, but at its source this score was great, and Mick Gordon continues to prove that he's the best metal composer in the business. The set pieces are all fantastic too. Not only are there plenty of over-the-top sequences that are just perfect for this franchise, but the locales were welcomely well varied. The aesthetics of Doom 2016 were great for the game itself, but it mostly just stuck to the Martian landscape, hell, or a generic laboratory, with little variants within or in between. Here we have, in addition to those areas, space, the arctic, overgrown temples, ruined cities, and creative alien planets. You can tell that everyone on the development team wanted to go above and beyond and make this their vision for Doom 2016 and then some. Now for a little bit of the bad. The story is really kind of dumb and bloated, it feels a little full of itself when it doesn't need to be, and plays itself a bit straight in a series that feels like anything but. It's not horrible, and overall I think it's worth it to provide an excuse for the ridiculous set pieces that I'm actually playing through. You just couldn't catch me giving a damn within cutscenes or in the codex entries. I just wanted to tear demons in half with my shotgun or hell sword. Also, some of the new mechanics are just not fun. It's a shame because of the few things that Eternal adds compared to its predecessor that are meant to feel fresh, they also kind of go against Doom's gameplay philosophy. Elements like the slow sludge terrain, uh, buff totems, and uh, the marauders. Elements like these slow the pace to a crawl and sometimes actively discourage shooting the demons in your path. So like, the opposite of what Doom should be. Also, while I didn't mind it, the decreased ammo limits was a downgrade from 2016 and it felt like fixing something that wasn't broke. Personally though, I still think it's a lot of fun if you adjust or just breeze through on an easier difficulty level, and I think that's my main point. At its core, Doom Eternal is very fun. 75% of the time, it's what Doom 2016 was 100% of the time. In my opinion, the exploration and platforming is good, and when it wants to be, the combat is great. It's hindered by some befuddling additions and mechanical reworking that stops it from being truly excellent. If you love Doom, you'll probably still like Eternal, as did I, and despite its shortcomings, I'd be lying if I said it didn't have some of my favorite gaming moments of this year. You ever feel like a game was made for you? Like, it meshes two of your favorite niche genres almost out of nowhere and you feel obligated to play it just to see how well it pulls it off? Well, for me, that was the sensation I got when I first heard about and first started playing Murder by Numbers. A mix between Ace Attorney-like detective visual novels and Picross puzzles, believe it or not. Both of these are types of games I adore on their own, and I was at the very least curious to see how developer Mediatonic would carry out this, to me, awesome idea. 
Mediatonic, of course, known for Fall Guys, Fable Fortune, and Hatoful Boyfriend. Oh, that's a wild resume. For me, anyway, I was very impressed with Murder by Numbers. On face value, it plays out like a by-the-number detective visual novel. Honor, a rising actor and daughter of a famous LA detective, becomes caught in the web of investigation after meeting a robotic friend named Scout, who provides help in their sleuthing. Scout scans various environments for clues, but there's a catch. When something is found, Scout's gotta scan the clue, and that has to be done via a Picross puzzle. I get giddy just thinking about it. Look, I love Picross, and incorporating this into the investigation setting was super clever, and I had such a great time with it. The story and characters are endlessly entertaining the whole way through. Very fleshed out for a VN of this size, and I was pleasantly surprised with the twists and turns we took on the game's four cases. Picross puzzles, both required and optional, get to be fairly challenging as well, and I personally never got bored of zoning out in between story-heavy sections to play some nice Picross puzzles. Scout and Honor, wait, oh fuck, are such a delightful buddy cop duo, and it's just such a feel-good game that puts a smile on my face the whole way through. And I loved watching them grow over time with their friends and facing the many conflicts the game presents. I love the mid-90s setting, along with the cutout art style that really works for a game like this. I think the game's only major fault is that it's kinda what you see is what you get. If just one of the two genres that make this game up are things you dislike or are uninterested in, you might be a little frustrated or just bored getting through it. This doesn't apply to me and my list, obviously, so I love both of these game styles, and if you're at least interested in both of them as well, I think this game has more than enough charm to give you plenty of enjoyment. For me, it did that, and then some. I certainly hope Mediatonic decides to keep going with a follow-up to Murder by Numbers, as I am eagerly excited for Honor and Scout's next adventure. Nintendo's PR and marketing was put in an interesting situation this year, as was every gaming company due to COVID. Though Nintendo handled their announcements with what I think was the weirdest strategy. They forewent their typical Nintendo Direct schedule for a lack of build-up entirely. Announcements for individual games just happened all year. Reveals that were meant to be compiled for scheduled Direct presentations were instead divvied up to be shown off at seemingly arbitrary times just on their YouTube or Twitter. You'd wake up one morning to learn about a new Paper Mario, Pikmin 3 Deluxe, Mario 3D All-Stars, and for me, the most exciting surprise, Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity. A prequel to Breath of the Wild to fill the gap as we wait for the earnest sequel using the entertaining warrior style. Hell yes, sign me up, and the end product absolutely delivered, but I wasn't always so sure. I think Warriors games are fun, but they can be a little niche and repetitive, and when they incorporate other franchises like this, it's mostly for a nice slice of fan service. and there's nothing wrong with that. I had a great time with the original Hyrule Warriors. It was treated as this love letter to the franchise that is worth existing just for how well it honored the series. But for something that would be considered a canon spin-off to the best-selling entry in the series, and in my opinion one of the greatest games ever made, it would need to be a little more substantial and consistent. Fortunately, I believe Omega Force and Koei realized this as well, and relished the challenge. The game is surprisingly well fleshed out, with the most notable example being the implementation of the Breath of the Wild art style that absolutely shines throughout the game. The score accompanying the game is wonderfully fitting for the Breath of the Wild world, and I'm kinda glad they didn't go with the standard rock remixes typical in Warrior games. We have what's in the original Hyrule Warriors, and what's there is great. But this original soundtrack really does the job for Age of Calamity. The story is also a lot of fun, great voice acting done with a lot of fun character interactions that I wanted to see more of during my original playthrough of Breath of the Wild. It's a great canon side story too. For those who argue it's not canon due to spoilery events that happen, I don't see it as any different than Ocarina of Time shenanigans, for better or worse. But I'd be lying if I said that wasn't part of why I love the lore of this series. 
It's a nice standalone story that offers some great encounters and set pieces, and I can't ask for much more from a Warriors game. Now, the gameplay is always going to be a bit hit or miss for anyone, but personally I had a lot of fun. If you are a Warriors fan, then you're going to love this game. Full stop. If not, I still think there's a lot to enjoy. The nature of combat is a really good combination of diversity and consistency between the 18 playable characters. Everyone has their traditional X and Y combo strings that are easy to pick up, but with unique timings and hitboxes, plus every character has a ZR ability or mechanic that's unique to them. All fun when combined with their movesets. Not to mention their specials and weak point attacks that are always fun spectacles in Warriors games. Age of Calamity also introduces items in the form of elemental rods that anyone can use in limited quantities, along with Shiko runes. Runes are particularly interesting because while every character uses the same four standard runes, they each use them slightly different and it's so entertaining seeing every combination. The general content is such a solid amount. I like the fan service in the original, but I honestly thought there was just too much content. Hundreds of levels and rankings and collections all under various conditions, it was pretty overwhelming. Though I guess depending on who you ask, that's not really a bad thing. But for me, this is way better. The story is longer, about 15 to 20 hours, but there's a more manageable amount of side challenges. Definitely a lot, but not the near infinite in the original. There's also a new feature in terms of quests, which is the main means of upgrading abilities, health, etc. Anything that's not experience. This mainly involves finding and collecting some of the various materials spread out in each level, either from attacking destructibles, from enemy drops, or bought in shops. It's a great way to incorporate an element from Breath of the Wild. Other elements such as cooking, weapon fusing, and other smithing features felt seamlessly incorporated from their source material. This honestly feels like such a complete package that I can't help but say that this is what a Warriors game should feel to me, at least when it comes to a spin-off title. So much love went into this game that I'm happy to recommend it to any fan of Breath of the Wild, and it definitely did the job of filling that Zelda void until its sequel finally greets us. I probably had heard of The Pathless prior to this year. It was shown at the Game Awards back in 2018, and of course I'm familiar with Giant Squid's previous endeavor with Absu, but it wasn't until the game's showing once again at the PlayStation 5 reveal event this year that I was sold, mainly by its art direction and its movement. The protagonist dashing through this landscape using intuitive archery to build up speed was enthralling to me, and that feeling absolutely carried over to the final product. Absu is great and beautiful, but at times it can feel more like an art game than an adventure game, and that's fine for what Giant Squid wants to create. However, The Pathless isn't just an artistic achievement, it's a solid action adventure in its own right. The hunter controls wonderfully, dashing and gliding through this world felt so calming and satisfying as I explored this island that kept sucking me in. It's a quiet game that thrives on your own exploration, using nothing but your surroundings. This is an open world game, but there's no minimap, or really even a menu at all. It's just you, your bow, your eagle, and this world in front of you. It never stops being fun though. Most of the world is pretty straightforward and focused. There isn't a lot besides the formulaic puzzles throughout, but I still had a lot of fun solving each one, and then continuing my relaxation traveling to the next puzzle in order to purify this island, suffering from the entity known as the God Slayer and its corrupted beasts. A lot of the atmosphere reminds me of Shadow of the Colossus, and I mean that in a great way. Running across this world, solving puzzles, and gliding from place to place formed a fantastic structure for Giant Squid's next game. The boss battles were surprise highlights as well. There's a superb soundtrack as well that guides a simple but strong and poignant narrative that gives this gorgeous world meaning. I did feel for the hunter's struggle, and I loved being in control of our exploration through this abandoned island. While only somewhat varied in its environments, what's here has a great art style that I couldn't get enough of. The Pathless isn't the longest experience, even if you try to collect everything like I did, but it's absolutely a memorable one, and I enjoyed nearly every second of it. There isn't a whole lot more I can say about The Pathless, but it's a tight indie experience that I'm so happy we are seeing more of in this day and age. You can tell Giant Squid and their developers have found their stride with their exploration art game aesthetic, with an impressively deep action adventure hidden underneath. 
I can easily recommend the Pathless to just about anyone. It was stirring, emotional, and a calming journey that I was always happy to just continue playing and vibe to. Here's to you, Giant Squid Studios. I look forward to see what you got cooking next. Is it cheating for me to put this game on here? For me personally, I don't think so, and for a couple reasons. Namely, this isn't a simple port. Everything has been retextured and remastered with faster load times, streamlined quality of life decisions, and a facelift on all models to make sure this game now looks amazing both zoomed in and zoomed out. Also for me, this was actually the first time I'd personally played Xenoblade Chronicles. I knew a lot about this game. I had watched a Let's Play years ago, but by the time hype was surrounding this one, I had just started college and didn't really have the time or energy to seek out a rare Wii title that I wouldn't get around to playing. That didn't stop me from paying attention about the series though. I was excited for both Xenoblade X and 2 as they were coming out. I played both and thought they were great. But in recent years, I kept hearing the same mantra from fans across the internet to any gamer who would listen. That mantra being, play Xenoblade. And I personally kept thinking, okay, I mean, these games are fun, but they feel a little niche and unintuitive. I like them, but I don't know if I can unconditionally recommend them to everyone. And after this year, I now know it's because people who say play Xenoblade aren't talking about those games. They're talking about this one. Finally, I experienced the original Xenoblade Chronicles for myself, and now I can say firsthand how incredible Monolith nailed this RPG. Everything about the game has retained what made it a masterpiece, all with what I've come to love from the series. Breathtaking worlds, god-tier soundtracks, stories and characters, and the passion of a developer who loves what they are making. What surprised me is how well this combat holds up. This is both the simplest Xenoblade has ever been in terms of playstyle, and in my opinion it's still the best. I'm not overwhelmed in menus or semantics, instead I'm calculating, strategizing, and growing my party. While I was never completely lost in other Xenoblades, there was definitely periods of time where I was just struggling to maintain the system's knowledge of these entries. I was surviving, but not really thriving. This is different. Everything here has been so streamlined and focused that all features present are the cream of the crop. Combined with one of my favorite stories in video games, I can't gush about this game enough. Dozens upon dozens of playtime that flow so naturally, combat, exploration, story, and side content are all some of the most fun experiences you can have in an RPG, all woven seamlessly together. I can safely say that this is one of the greatest games I've ever played, maybe even a top 10, and it's only this far down on this year because I would feel guilty putting a remaster of a 10 year old game any higher. Oh right, uh, Future Connected. It's fine. A decent epilogue that supplies a nice arc for one of the best characters in this game, and a nice excuse to return to this incredible world. On its own, it shouldn't sell you on the game though. What should sell you, however, is the definitive best way to experience one of the greatest RPGs since the turn of the century. So it seems like every year now I like to play at least one super story-driven adventure game that really lingers in my mind with thought-provoking themes for weeks after, and sucks me into their world without remorse. And this year I was surprised which game that was. Thanks to the likes of Uchikoshi's Zero Escape Trilogy and I the Somnium Files, along with games like 428 Shibuya Scramble, I've fallen in love with flowchart-like storytelling and intertwining narratives of numerous protagonists. This year I was able to experience one of the best examples with the likes of 13 Sentinels, Aegis Rim. I'm not the most prolific in terms of vanillaware, but I definitely call myself a fan. I loved Odin Sphere and Muramasa. If they have a new project in the works, I'll definitely take notice. Though for me, the most memorable aspects of these games were their action-oriented gameplay and their gorgeous distinctive art style. When I heard that their latest game would be a mix between adventure and real-time strategy, I did a little double take, and it's a PS4 exclusive no less. This was their next big entry that they're pushing the limits of what their team is capable of? Well, yeah, absolutely they are. 
Let's start with the RTS parts, and I've heard people describe it as the weaker half of the game, and yeah, I think that's an objective fact, but it's by no means bad. It's simple, but definitely fun. Upgrading my sentinels to each type's strengths was really enjoyable, and strategizing against unique enemy configurations was a satisfying experience. They are a bit easy to be sure, but I think I'd prefer that to the alternative. I'll preface this next bit by saying that the adventure half is the stronger portion of the game, but it's often intense and a little head-scratching at times. I'd much rather the RTS sections to be a somewhat chill breather portion, rather than a slog that I dreaded going back to when I'd rather be on the other side. All I'm saying is, it works for what it is, and it definitely doesn't detract from the game for me. Now for the meat of this game, the narrative adventure half. This game is probably my favorite story of the year, though some other entries do make a valid effort. The plot starts with a relatively typical 1980s setting, with a seemingly simple setup involving what appears to be an alien invasion, and some gifted teenagers with the ability to pilot mecha that can stop it. Sounds like your typical average mecha anime from a simpler time, right? Then things get weird. We start seeing other events, sometimes flashbacks from the past, and the distant future? Wait, some of these 13 protagonists are from various time periods? What's going on? And how do these characters seemingly know each other during the strategy parts? The intermingling of these characters' paths, and the dozens of cliffhangers the game purposefully leaves during numerous branches of these characters' flowcharts sends me into adventure game narrative bliss. Each of these characters is so compelling and unique in their own right, you can tell their strength based on how excited I was, no matter who the character is, to jump back into their story and pick up wherever they left off, and face the consequences of whatever revelation shattered their world. This is a thought-provoking story, one that will keep you guessing as to the true nature of this game from minute one to the final moments of this near 40-hour story, and I wouldn't have it any other way. These are the types of storytelling I love to see in this medium, where this esoteric type of narrative can work wonders when the player decides the pace. And this isn't even touching on the presentation. I missed out on Dragon's Crown and never experienced the Odin Sphere PS4 remake, so this was actually my first time playing a Vanillaware game in HD and just, like, come on man, look at it. The backgrounds, the character art, oh god it's just, woo! that's what I love to see. I know this type of game isn't for everyone, but even if it's something you've considered trying, or you are a fan of this type of game, please, I encourage you to give this one a shot. Vanillaware really created something special here, and I'm glad to say I was able to experience it myself this year. Okay, let me preface this by saying, I have never played the original Final Fantasy VII. I have no nostalgic connection to it, and besides knowing the basic story beats and the characters, I have nothing to personally compare this upcoming entry on this list to. Now to those who have experienced both this upcoming entry and the original FF7, if that disclaimer invalidates my opinion in your eyes, or just weakens my impression to you, I understand. I know what this game meant to people, and I don't want to undersell that if changes were made that disappointed you, if you felt like risks were taken where they weren't needed, and they played too much with what was always going to be a personal experience for you, I get it. I can empathize with that. And the fact of the matter is there is truth in there. Risks were taken, changes were made, and this ended up not being a play it safe cash grab remaster. And yet, speaking from personal experience, and a lot of post-analysis over the past year, I can safely say, I love Final Fantasy VII Remake. I love everything about this game, more than can be succinctly described in this list, but I'll do my best. Let's actually start with my favorite aspect of the game, the combat. I'm being completely serious when I say this might be my favorite RPG combat system I have ever experienced. This is how a AAA Final Fantasy in the present day should play. The transition of the ATB gauge and the usage of tactical mode to translate the feeling of turn-based RPGs is just brilliant, while at the same time utilizing inherent tactics of an ARPG system. 
Everything great about FF7 customization is retained from material loadouts to weapon skill trees, it's all perfectly fine-tuned. Swapping between characters on the fly to use each of their unique loadouts that are all incredible to be in control of. Every battle is engaging in the best way possible. Instantly planning a strategy felt incredible every time a fight started. This is especially coming from Final Fantasy XV, a game I played only about two-ish years ago, which was one of the most shallow combat systems I've ever played. In comparison, this is a complete 180. A masterpiece of RPG combat that I can't wait to see expanded upon, and what new characters we'll be able to bring to the table in the second part. Now, the other half of the game. The presentation. First, the easy targets. This game looks astounding. Good god, every character and every enemy looks jaw-droppingly gorgeous, and the environments, oh, we have come so far in the last 23 years. I can't get over how beautiful every town, every battle scene, every detail has been handcrafted. And the music, oh, this might be my favorite OST of the year. Every classic track has been given new life in so many new distinct styles that somehow made some of the most memorable tracks in gaming more memorable. Uematsu and the rest of the audio team absolutely outdid themselves. Finally, the story. Now, I don't think people should have too much fault with the first 75%-ish. It's basically the same as the original, but with more detail, more character interactions, and just more to do. This is a definitive version of most of the Midgar intro of Final Fantasy VII. These characters are just so lovable, and seeing them come together as a true party by the end really hits hard. They took some risks here and there, but I think it was for the best during most of these segments. Shinra has been made into this real gargantuan threat, and taking them on feels like a genuine, larger-than-life challenge, fitting for a larger-than-life remake. Now let's talk about the elephant in the room. The last act. Even nine months after release, I'm hesitant to spoil much, but I will say despite its controversy and risks, I love this part too. I think some of the meta aspects and the whispers of fate could have definitely been handled better, but elements like the final chapter completely tearing apart the canonical foundation of this franchise, the aforementioned meta aspects being introduced at all felt sort of incredible by the end. The fact that we've been torn away from the destined path this journey was seemingly going to lead on feels wild. I've fallen in love with these characters in this world for the first time in my life, and now I don't know what the future holds, and that's a great feeling for me. This truly is a remake, in every sense of the word. In the same way I respect and sometimes glorify Metal Gear Solid 2 for being an artistic deconstruction of the idea of a sequel, I already am and likely will continue to do the same to Final Fantasy VII Remake for being a deconstruction of the idea of a remake. Changing what people expect, what it means to defy expectations, a new, fantastic structure hidden under a familiar shell and an existing foundation. Don't let the price tag or the fact that this is a quote part one of a larger story fool you. This is a full, complete package of a game. I spent 40 to 50 hours on my first playthrough and another 30 playing through the whole game again on hard to get all the PSN trophies. Those who know me know I never do that, especially right after finishing the game. But I loved this game so much, the first thing I wanted to do was jump back in. To me, Final Fantasy VII Remake is brilliant because of its risks, and how it comes out the other side being one of my favorite gaming experiences, both in its gameplay and its journey through this unforgettable world. Before making this list, I gave myself the ground rule that I wouldn't put any early access games on this list that hadn't actually been released. In order to make this list, a game needed to have its version 1.0 released this year. Fortunately, this meant I was able to include one of my most memorable experiences all year. Of course, I'm talking about... That's right, the latest entry in Supergiant's growing catalog, Hades finally left Early Access this year, though that didn't mean a whole lot to me personally. While it was playable since late 2018, I started playing it maybe about a month before the game's version 1.0 release came out, so 
This is very much a 2020 game for me. Not only that, but this might be the biggest surprise of the year for me. And at face value, in a lot of ways, it shouldn't be. I love Supergiant games. Bastion, Transistor, and Pyre all have special places in my heart for different reasons, so why would this one be any different? Well, it mainly has to do with the genre of game. You see, when it comes to my taste, this, I like this. I like everything about this. I want more of this. Hey, wait, wait, what, what, what's that underneath? Oh shit! Yeah, I've never once really been able to get into roguelikes, and I personally don't think it's for a lack of trying. Rogue Legacy, Dead Cells, Enter the Dungeon, Wizard of Legend, Crypt of the Necrodancer, none have really been able to capture my interest, always feeling a bit too repetitive, draining, monotone, or some mixture of that. I don't want to diss people like them either. I get it. I know that they have a lot to offer, and they seem a lot of fun for those who enjoy them that way. But it's never really clicked for me personally. That is, until Hades. This game, this incredible game, changed everything. Hades solves everything I had wrong with the genre, an actively shifting and evolving story that gets expanded upon every run, a fast and fluid combat system that rewards experimentation where every combination is unique and fun, and a hefty amount of permanent progression that makes every run feel valuable. Gameplay has always been kind of a weaker aspect to Supergiant's games for me. Don't get me wrong, it's never bad. They're always fun and unique, each of them. Probably my personal favorite being Transistor's real-time strategy style, but I always played these games for their presentation, music, and story. Here it's different. Supergiant has mastered an ARPG-like dungeon crawler in their trademark isometric style. Zagreus is so fluid right off the bat, and only gets more fun the more you master each weapon and the aforementioned boons, both permanent and temporary for the run. I can't stress enough how significant it was for me to finally get it. For the first time playing a roguelike after dying on a 30 minute run, I instantly regripped my controller and simply said, again. And this isn't even touching on what Supergiant has already proven they're the best in the business at, and that's their presentation. The artwork, including models, portraits, and backgrounds, are all utterly superb. I love this thicker line art style so much. It's also vibrant and works really well for the underworld vibe it has going on. Speaking of the underworld setting, the story and environment is incredible. I never thought a roguelike could pull off a story like this, but goddamn, leave it to Supergiant to just keep proving me wrong. This cast of characters are already some of my favorite in a video game, and are brought to life by fantastic interactions and voice work. Darren Korb once again returns with not just his voice to one of my favorite protagonists now, but also his traditional score, and just knocks it out of the park. If you're a fan of games or music, and you haven't listened to any of Korb's work at this point, like, come on, you're doing yourself a disservice. Here it's no different, a lot of bastion tones, but heavier, and a bit grungier and darker, and it works so well. This whole game is just a perfect storm of everything I never knew I wanted. This is my favorite game in the developer's catalog because of how complete it feels in its quality, every aspect polished to perfection, and the very definition of memorable. I'm going to keep playing Hades into 2021, and if anything I've said so far has enticed you, you should be too. Now for some quick honorable mentions, as I mentioned in the beginning, I did play a lot this year. Trials of Mana was a solid remake of a classic action RPG that finally came to the West. Paradise Killer was an enjoyable, super stylish murder mystery. I didn't expect to be into Battle Royales this year, but both Fall Guys and Spellbreak were a lot of fun, especially with multiple people. As was Riot Games' new shooter Valorant. Also, I'm really enjoying Immortals Phoenix Rising, and it definitely could have made this list but I'm still playing it at the moment, and I wanted to beat it before making my final verdict. So, unfortunately, I withheld it from the list proper. With all that out of the way, though, let's get to my number one. What is there left to say about Ori? especially from me. I've been very vocal about my love for this fledgling series and what it means to me, and it's been easy to continue gushing about it. 
With Ori's representation in Rivals, plus his games being ported to Switch, the series is more relevant than ever, and coming into this year, I had my eyes on one title to continue that positive energy given to me from this series. As the sequel to one of my favorite games of all time, and one of the most important personal journeys for me, Ori and the Will of the Wisps had a lot to live up to. Things were shaping up well though, it was still the same passionate team who delivered us the first game, seemingly emboldened to give us more of what made the first game so wonderful, and that's what got me excited. Give me more Ori, please, I'll gladly experience any of the content Moon Studios puts out. And incredibly, my expectations weren't just met, but blown away by Will of the Wisps. For starters, the basis of the first game is all still held intact and expanded upon with its exquisite presentation and soundtrack. All things I've gushed about numerous times before, but I'll continue to do so again. Moon Studios is able to breathe so much beauty and craft into each of their distinctive areas and I eat up every second of every screen. And the score, my god, Gareth Coker, hats off to you, you can make me giddy, emotional, cry at any cue, and I can't help but take a moment to respect it throughout my entire adventure. Ori controls just as fluidly, if not more so, becoming one of my favorite Metroidvania characters ever to play as. His moveset has been completely overhauled. A lot of movement staples are retained, but his weapon and skill system has been entirely revamped with so many amazing abilities to experiment with, allowing you to find your favorite to accompany you on this vast adventure. And this game is pretty big, probably about twice as big as the original Blind Forest, and it's all unique. There's no padding to be found here. Quite the contrary, Moon Studios has done a wonderful job incorporating numerous collectibles and objectives into every nook and cranny of this wonderful game. Not only that, but now a hub town of sorts is included, featuring numerous NPCs, quest lines, and shops. Honestly, it all feels a bit Zelda-esque in terms of its overworld design, and that's absolutely a compliment. That's not to detract from the dungeons and level designs as well. This whole world has been seamlessly crafted and you can feel the amount of work put into this whole game. Finally, the story. I'm not going to spoil anything because I want people to experience this on their own for the first time. This game perfectly captures the concluding themes that make this duology of games feel so complete. Ori is on a quest to save his new friend Ku, the child of the first game's antagonist. Along the way, he encounters loss, tragedy, but also hope in a way that can only be conveyed this well through an experience like Ori. Ori as a character became so much more to me after experiencing this journey with him. The game thrives on giving you hope and reason to continue, only to take that all away when fate decides it. But that doesn't stop this little light spirit. I always try and make sure that my game of the year is one that not only meant the most to me over the course of the year in terms of enjoyment, memorability, and emotion, but also a game that I feel like no matter what, anyone should play. An experience where if you are a fan of this wonderful medium, you owe it to yourself to jump in. I anticipate I'll want to go more into this at a later time, but frankly, Ori and the Blind Forest meant so much to me. A light in a dark time that reminded me of beauty in the world. Will of the Wisps does one better. In a time of my life where I've come to terms with a lot of my own life and self-worth, and I'm ready to focus on the world around me and leave my mark. In this tumultuous year of disarray, destruction, and tragedy and darkness, Will of the Wisps reminds me of hope. Not just the encouragement to spread wings, but to push forward, to protect what's worth protecting, and to help when you can. This has been a meaningful year for me. Despite everything, I accomplished a lot that I'm proud of, and that's not an easy thing for me to say. And making this list every year always tends to put that all in perspective with my gaming experiences. This is a part of my life that means more than I can describe, and when I think of an experience I want to take away from 2020, I want to remember the hardship, the loss, but also the feeling of pushing through and the potential to become the hope that can make this world better. Ori captures the feeling I want to share with everyone I love, and carries the emotion I want to remember this year for. And that's why my game of the year for 2020 is Ori and the Will of the Wisps.
Thank you so much for watching. I unfortunately wasn't able to get this one out by the end of the year, but hey, that's alright. I didn't do too bad. As I mentioned previously, this has been a super productive year for me, and I am looking forward to keeping up that momentum into 2021. I'm definitely looking forward to seeing what this next year has to offer us in terms of video games and other events. If you're watching this, I wish you the best, and have a good one. Wherever or whenever. This was Kermik. See you guys next time.